Good morning, everybody. My name is Porik Gilligan. I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Sight. And today I'm joined by El Quang of Untangled, a member of the board of Sight, to talk about the Incentive Travel Industry Index, uh, which is a, a major survey of the incentive travel industry that has been conducted over the last number of weeks, courtesy of FICP, IRF, and Site Foundation in association with Oxford Economics. So we're gonna talk you through some of the preliminary outcomes of this very, very interesting research. And then thanks to Al and thanks to his uh, extensive experience in Asia as a destination and source market for incentive travel, uh, he's gonna give us a filtered view of uh, the results from the Asia perspective. So we're gonna jump straight into it. And um, we want to thank our sponsors for 2020. Uh, these surveys take place because people support us. So thank you to Destination Canada. Thank you to Abu Dhabi. Thank you to Accor and to the IMEX group for stepping up and helping us to actually make this very, very important survey. It's the biggest we've ever undertaken. We had just under 3,000 submissions from all over the world. Uh, about 15% of the submissions came from Asia. So a very, very substantial amount of the input came from the, uh, the greater Asia PAC region. Um, we had submissions from 41 source markets. So a source market is a market out of which incentive travel is contracted. So it's a kind of a buyer's market. So places like China, uh, Australia, New Zealand would be strong source markets in Asia. In Europe, it would be Germany and the United, uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, in North America, it would be the US and Canada. They would be source markets. We had 91 destinations and a destination is obviously a location that hosts incentive travel experiences. And um, Asia has many, many wonderful destinations. I think immediately of Thailand, I think of Malaysia, I think of Bali, but there are so many. Uh, if we go into the um, Oceania region, uh, Fiji uh, and so on, uh, destinations that are really those kind of dream locations in the world that people really want to visit. And Asia is uh, very fortunate to have so many great destinations. So 41 source markets, 91 destinations, and then 19 different industry verticals. So an industry vertical is obviously a, an area of industry that has responded to the survey. And uh, the number one area was finance and insurance. So we, I think we know that, that insurance companies and financial institutions are big users of incentive travel. Automotive was number two. Uh, pharma was number three. IT was number four. And direct selling uh, was number five. So these are the areas that the um, uh, survey is representing results from mostly, although it does have input from 19 different verticals. Now, one of the, um, the changes that we made this year, because this is uh, an annual survey, it's been going for a number of years, and this is its latest iteration, but because obviously of the pandemic, uh, we needed to make sure that this year's survey um, captured uh, the, I suppose, the reality of the, the, uh, the, the pandemic and how it was impacting on the lives of incentive travel professionals all over the world. So there were a series of questions asked specifically around COVID-19 and its impact on the global industry. And I think what we're seeing here is that the impact overall is temporary. It's focused on cost cutting, but it's also focused on developing new skills, new revenue streams, and achieving a better work-life balance. Now that's interesting because I think when we think of the pandemic, we tend to think of the negative impacts, but there are a lot of underlying positive things that are happening. There's a reset that's happening in our industry because of the pandemic, and that is a good thing. However, this is the global picture. This is the aggregate picture for all the world. So when we take all of the results, this is what they look like. When we go into the regional version, it's a little bit different. And this is where it gets 
I think, particularly interesting. Because on this slide, what we're seeing is, we're seeing uh, in blue and dark blue, we're seeing the UK. In orange, we're seeing the US. In gray, we're seeing Latin America. In yellow, we're seeing Europe. And then this is the one to look out for. In the lighter blue color, we're seeing Asia. So this is showing us where the APAC region is in relation to other regions of the world when it comes to the impact of COVID. And the first thing, and I know Elle is going to have some interesting comments on this when we, when we finish the presentation, but the first thing that we see, if we look over on the left-hand side, is that when it comes to the situation of businesses that as a result of COVID-19 had to close their doors, had to shutter up, had to stop, we see that Asia is the area that suffered the most, which is, which is interesting. We can see a higher percentage there, close on 10% of businesses in, in, in Asia have closed as a result of the pandemic. Whereas if you look at the other areas of the world, it's significantly less there, particularly in Latin America. If we look to the next column, we get some indication of, you know, why that might have been less the case in, in other regions. Because the next column shows us how, as a result of COVID-19, businesses in the incentive travel area were able to benefit from government supports. And we can see there that the UK, over 60% of those businesses were able to benefit from government supports. But look at the United States, it's below 40%. So that's a huge regional variation between an area that is able to continue to trade because the government is providing a, a support structure around that. That's the case in the UK. That's the case as well in Europe, as you can see from the higher yellow mark. But in the, um, in the US, it's not. It's actually much significantly less. And Asia then, in general, is doing OK. But when we deep dive into that, we see that most of the government supports were in the Oceania region of, the, of APAC, coming in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the next one shows us the, uh, the incidence of digital. So COVID-19 came, what did we do? Well, we went digital. And you can see Asia there in light blue performing very, very well, jumping immediately into the new scenario. But the next one is probably the most interesting from, from Asia. And it shows the entrepreneurial spirit that's at the core of the Asian viewpoint of, 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 of business. So maybe businesses closed, but if they did, they started again and they went out and they looked for other revenues. And you can see there in Asia that that kind of pursuit of other ways of bringing revenue into your business is much higher than anywhere else other than the United States. So I think everybody knows that in North America, there's a real entrepreneurial culture. But here, what I'm seeing is that entrepreneurial culture in Asia is even stronger. If we look at recovery, and again, it's very, very interesting here. Uh, on the left-hand side of the graph, we're seeing the 2020 picture. And that's showing how far below that kind of, um, that target. And the target is the level that we reached in 2019. So the blue line that runs across the middle of the screen, that refers to our revenues and our activities in incentive travel in, in, in 2019. 2020, you can see we fell far below. Uh, look at all of the regions, as much as 78% of a drop. However, what are we seeing in Asia at the end? The drop was less. Move into 2021, what are we seeing in Asia? The recovery is more. Move into 2022, what are we seeing in Asia? The recovery is even more. And that continues into 2023. So what we're seeing in Asia is a much more rapid recovery with respect to what is happening in the rest of the world. We're seeing a resilience. We're seeing an ability to bounce back, to get back on your feet and start again. And that's an extraordinary thing. I want to talk a little bit because maybe this, that's all good news. So I want to talk maybe a little bit on things that might be a little bit worrying 
particularly if I'm a DMC or a DMO in, in, in Asia. And the next slide shows destination choice from Europe. And what we've done here is we've laid out the top 10 um, areas or regions of the world that were selected by buyers in Europe over the last number of years. And if you look at 2018, and I should point out straight away, it's no surprise, the number one region where uh, incentive travel goes is always that region. So for Asian buyers, you'll see it's exactly the same. For US buyers, it's the same. For Western Europe buyers, Western Europe will be the number one. You always stay within the region first and then you go outside. So in 2018, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing Europe going to Western Europe and the emerging new uh, Europe in places like Poland and Slovenia and, 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 and so on. United States was in third position. Look at Southeast Asia there in fifth position in 2018, Northeast Asia in ninth position. So Asia well represented within the top 10 selections in uh, 2018. Look at 2019, it improves, it gets even better. So European buyers in 2019 are programming Southeast Asia in the fourth position. Thanks probably to the pretty extraordinary marketing job done. And I'm gonna call out Thailand here. They've, they've, they've been absolutely extraordinary. They've really built a strong business and great profile for, for the country. And we can see that in, 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 in these figures straight away. So 2019, in the fourth position, Southeast Asia. In the fifth position, Northeast Asia. So very well represented. And then coming in very strongly, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Tahiti and so on, all that Oceania region. But look at 2020. It's, I suppose, present by its absence. Where's Asia? It's not there. And uh, Oceania is there. And I'll make a comment on this later on as to why I think that might be the case. But what we're seeing here as a result of COVID and as a result of kind of destination sort of choice and projection going into the future is a much greater kind of focus on staying close at home or a focus on going to places that are perceived to be safe. So Abu Dhabi, Dubai in the, in, in the Gulf states, they're in there. Australia, New Zealand in Oceania, they're in there. Canada is up there. The United States doesn't appear on the list at all. It was in third position in 2018 and 2019. It disappears out of the top 10. In fact, it's in 15th position. It's in the last position for European buyers. But look at Alaska and Hawaii. They're also in the United States. They're not contiguous states, but they are part of the United States. So it's nothing against the states. It's against the perception of a safe destination. And when we think of places like Alaska, we think of wide open spaces, we think of the outdoors, we think of adventure. When we think of Hawaii, we think of beaches, we think of sunshine, we think of, again, forests and so on. So again, what we're seeing here is a move away from urban destinations, a move away from crowds, and a focus on places where there's lots of space. Um, so even other Africa countries, other Middle East countries and East Africa, areas that didn't really feature so much before, they're coming in. So that's, that's the situation for, from, from Europe. So obviously the Asian DMOs, the DMCs, the destination suppliers, there's a little bit of work to do, maybe around reassurance, maybe around getting a message out around safety, uh, because in other parts of the survey, and we're not covering it during these slides, they are the concerns that are actually top of, of the list. Now, most destinations around the world depend on North America for incentives because that is probably the, the primary uh, location in the world for contracting incentive travel, particularly lucrative incentive travel, you know, big ticket uh, activities and so on. So it's a really important source market for us all. And again, if we look over the last kind of couple of years, what we're seeing is we're seeing between 2018 and 2019, a growth in, in, in focus on Asia, which is fantastic. We reported on this last year, you'll, you'll, you'll remember, 
but there's Oceania and Southeast Asia and South Asia all featuring in the two, uh, 2019 choice for North Americans or for, for yeah, for North America, because that includes Canada as well. 2020, uh, no Asia, just Oceania in there as well. Look at all of the locations that North Americans are going to. They're all close by. They're all locations that they can get to easily. There's a real domestic focus there. But there's also a focus on locations that are outdoors, that are adventure orientated. Forests, beaches, lakes, not cities. And in fact, when, when we look at, and I'm not showing you this slide uh, today, but in another part of the survey, when we look at the, uh, the type of location that's not being selected in this COVID era that, 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 that we're living in, uh, it's urban areas, it's built up areas, and it's cruise ships. They're the three that are at the very bottom of the list. So we, we took a look at, um, at Asia as well because Asia is a big source market. And uh, it's very interesting to look at how the, um, how the rankings are changing even within Asia. I decided to kind of to put down all of the different locations that are, are kind of included in that term Oceania, because it's very interesting. Obviously, Australia and New Zealand are there, but there's a lot of other um, Polynesian islands that have a huge appeal, uh, particularly in the area of in, in, incentive travel. So when we say Oceania, they're the kind of places we're, we're, we're talking about as well. So where were Asian and Oceanian buyers looking at over the last number of years? Well, Southeast Asia was, was, was very high on the list, as we can see, in, in 2018, uh, North, followed by Northeast Asia, uh, followed by Western Europe, followed by the Gulf states and the United States then up there in sixth position. So Asian buyers were buying in Asia, but strangely, a greater percentage of Asian buyers were buying outside their region than buyers from any other region and their region, if, 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 if you get my point. So Asia always had, Asian buyers always had a, a view beyond the Asia region to places like Europe and the United States. And we can see that very clearly in their choice of destinations for 2018. We're seeing it in 2019 as well. There's the United States solid uh, in, in sixth position. Western Europe comes up to second position for, 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 for Asians. And then we move into 2020 and it changes again. So the same kind of, um, the, the same perception that impacts on how European buyers and North American buyers see destination choice is happening for Asians as well. So Oceania comes in as a very, very strong number one. That's in the first position. So Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, number two, Canada then, number three. You know, why is that? Well, wide open spaces, healthy lifestyle, fresh air, mountains, lakes, beautiful scenery, the outdoors, Alaska is next up, similar kind of characteristics. Then we've got Northeast Asia cropping in there, Hawaii is in there, the Gulf states are there. And again, for Asia buyers, the United States is bottom of the list and Europe, as you can see, drops out of the top 10 as well. So again, the perception of what might be safe is obviously impacting hugely on the choice. We're, we're, we're nearly coming to the point where I'm gonna be bringing in uh, L and uh, having a little bit of a discussion. But before we do, there's just two final slides. So program design and inclusions, it's, it's really, really interesting when we compare the 2019 situation with the 2020 situation. I think what we're seeing is, we're seeing here the beginnings of what incentive travel 2.0 is going to look like. Um, if I could just take it through the 2019 inclusions, cultural experiences, for obvious reasons, travel is about going to places and discovering the culture of that place. So no surprises that that's in the first place. Group dining, no surprise at all. Incentive travel is promoted by a corporation. The corporation has very, very clear objectives around bringing its workforce together, linking its officers and its qualifiers uh, during the kind of the days that they're away from the office, 
building the workplace culture as a result of that. And the next one, team building, that's another example of how that happens. I play golf with the HR director. Um, I meet the, uh, the CEO because we're put into the same team for this fun activity that we're doing and so on. So all really important in terms of um, what an incentive travel experience sets out to do from a corporate perspective. And then those luxury experiences. Luxury experiences, we also use the term a bucket list experience. And a bucket list, it's a, it's a complex kind of term in English, but <clears throat> it relates to the fact that uh, there's a phrase in English that when you die, you kick the bucket. It's, I don't know how it comes about or why kicking the bucket means dying, but it does. So you kick the bucket when you die. So your bucket list is all those things you want to do before you die. And um, these are kind of those incredible sort of one-off things like going to Machu Picchu, uh, going to the Galapagos Islands, walking on the Great Wall of China, uh, visiting the, um, the shrines in Thailand and so on, seeing Ares Rock or um, Uluru in, uh, in, in Australia. Uh, these are kind of once in a lifetime things and um, they're called bucket list experiences and they were in the fourth position. Switch now into 2020 and what happens? Well, first of all, what we're seeing is that that aspect of the travel experience that amazing once-off experience, that's now number one. The cultural experiences are still there as number two. So in a way, in the first two places, what's happened is we've switched to really focusing on the intrinsic joy of travel. It's all about the travel. So the corporate objectives, they're kind of played down now. They come in in a different way. They're still there. But companies now, in designing travel experiences for the future, they want to set their qualifiers free. They want them to have these incredible experiences. It's a travel with no strings attached. But it's also a travel with a conscience, travel with a purpose, because CSR, that's come right up now into the third position. So I travel, and I understand now that when I travel, that has an impact on the environment. So how can I make up for that? And what we're seeing here is a greater focus on CSR as a key element of program design. And then wellness, obviously. Well, we work hard. We work extremely hard. Our reward is a travel experience. During that experience, we want to be able to relax. We want to focus on ourselves. We want to be able to undertake things that are good for our bodies that are good for our souls, that are good for our minds. And that's how we're designing experiences now as we live in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. We're looking to, to liberate, to go out again, to have these incredible travel experiences. And that brings us really to the, uh, the conclusion. And then we'll be, be jumping right into a series of questions with, uh, with, with, with Elle. Um, what we can say is that in all of the regions of the world, there's a total alignment around the fact that incentive travel will recover. However, that's not the, the question. The question is not if at all, the question is when. And I think we're seeing different sort of points of recovery in different areas. There's alignment around recovery, but there's divergency around what it will look like. There's a continued prioritization of soft power over hard dollars. So previously, we measured the success of an incentive travel program on the ROI, on the return on investment that it brought to the company bottom line. And we'd always do that. But now we're also concerned about all of those soft power elements, all of those intangible benefits that happen where by being on an incentive travel experience, I connect with others in my company and I build up that workplace culture. There's a focus on the intrinsic joy of travel experiences. There's tra it's travel with no strings attached, too many company promotions or meetings or whatever. That's not going to be the emphasis, but also travel with a conscience. And we can see that as CSR rises in the rankings. And then in terms of destination choice, Destinations perceived to have dealt well with COVID-19 will recover quicker than others.
So that's a little kind of snapshot of what the uh, outcomes of the Incentive Travel Industry Index have been. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined with one of my favorite people in the industry, El Quang. Hi, Corey. What did you think of that presentation? Was it okay? Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's very informative. And I think it sets the good base uh, for anyone who is planning towards 2021 in terms of whether it's business model or their pricing model or their you know, content development. So I think it's absolutely useful. Excellent. And one, one of the things that comes out very strongly is this kind of resurgence in Asia. And now it is, you know, we'll, we'll come back to the, to, the, to the fact that more Asian businesses have gone out of business than, than anywhere else in the world, but there's an extraordinary resurgence. It's really powering ahead with respect to other regions in the world. Does, does that surprise you? Um, not, not really. Only, only because if you look at the past, especially the past uh, eight months or ever since COVID happened in our, in the, across the world, uh, Asia, the Asia region experienced that impact first and went into a quick drive to see, to understand what COVID was all about and the, the restriction in place uh, or needed to put in place uh, to control the spread of the virus. So, and also the fact that um, in the, particularly in some of the um, Asian countries like China, Singapore, um, where the, the restriction, uh, the government has made mandatory uh, uh, advice on wearing masks or, or wash or hygiene practices. So you can see a direct result and impact on the action. Uh, whereas I guess in some other parts of the world where um, the mandate is not strong or, or not, not as swift um, and uh, to make well-informed decision, I think that's where you see the resurgence of waves and, 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 and things like that. So, Interesting, interesting. I'm just wondering, is, is there something though in the, um, in the APAC business mindset that accounts for the resilience, this bounce back ability that we're seeing in Asia, that's, that's happening at a much bigger rate than anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, as you say earlier, Asia Pacific as a region is really diverse, uh, you know, talking from China, India, all the way to Australia and to wonderful islands like Vanuatu and the, the culture and behavior is completely different. But the, the common thread that uh, the ties uh, across this region is the impact of outbound uh, business from China. So, so the, the region relies heavily on, on, on China and when China closes its doors because uh, of the, the impact of COVID, the, 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 is actually felt. So, so we, we don't really have a choice within this region. We have to be innovative. Uh, that's why you see you know, uh, the new revenue streams or, or new activities or business activities that people have created uh, uh, as a result of that, because they, they do feel the pain because we, we rely heavily on, on that, on that um, feed market. There, 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 there is the situation as well, though, that more businesses in Asia than anywhere else in the world have closed as a result of, um, of, of, of COVID. Um, and, I'm, and I'm just wondering, in, in some regions, Europe in particular, failure in business is really not an option. It's, 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 it's something that people really kind of would be very ashamed of if they had to close their business and try and start again. But in the United States, I know people willingly kind of, you know, start again and get back on their feet and so on. How is it in Asia? What's, what's the kind of the, the, the mindset around, say, you know, having to close a business or like business failure? Is, 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 the, is there a kind of a, um, a resilience there that... A, that allows that person to kind of just get back up and start again. Yeah, I, I, and I think that when you talk about um, resilient qualities uh, like resilience or agility, that that has a lot to do with the individual life experiences, uh, depending on where they were raised and the family culture and even corporate culture. So it 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 doesn't in this region it doesn't have a real significance in terms of uh, a particular. Uh, uh, culture that 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 that, that spite that resilience uh, behavior and so forth. Uh, when it comes to shame, I think that across uh, that is quite inclusive in a way that you know everybody will feel shame if the company that you started, especially if you're a business owner, has to wrap up. What we we see is perhaps um, the 
at the very start of COVID, one of the key things uh, we quickly learned other than adapting to technology is the, uh, the power of communication um, and the need for it. So we were, we had, when you have no choice, you just become creative. And we all started to learn to make sure that the communication is strong to, to reduce the impact or the negative impact of false perception, why one chooses the, to close a company. But just in general, from a perhaps, you know, a, a, a Chinese culture, I would say, because I've, I've, I'm of that, ethnic, um, of that uh, heritage, it's the fact that we, we do look quite long term and closure of business is, it could be because of cash flow or we, we are not really, uh, we could not invest further uh, into the particular area of the business and divert that, that, um, that spend. Uh, into other areas of, of business. So what we have witnessed over the past few months, for example, is some agencies were still operating, they diverted that, that investment into content development. So right. develop content that could really enhance the experience. Uh, that's one thing for sure. The other thing is uh, we see the, uh, the, emer- the, um, the, inc- the increase in smaller venues uh, and experiences that could not, in the past, would not be considered uh, uh, by the, the large MLM groups or the large incentive travel groups. But now, where there is limitations in terms of number of people per experience, it opens up opportunities for that. The other thing that we we quickly also learn is the fact that some agencies also um, di- um, uh, man- we have maintained a, a very healthy conversation or relationship with their customer have um, channeled the, the brand experience to the customer by having by developing grooming kits and, and uh, to, to prepare speakers, to, to prepare senior management who are addressing uh, their, their team members over a digital platform. So that became a slightly different revenue stream uh, to, uh, as compared to the uh, uh, day-to-day operations of running an incentive travel program. Wow. I think we, we've always had a sense that Asia was the continent uh, of uh, and the region of, of really the entrepreneur. And I think that's what you're kind of, um, what you're confirming, El, that that is the case, that Asians know how to close a business when it needs to be closed, but then get right back up and uh, find the kind of the, the market uh, that, and, and, and create the product for that market in, in very, very quick time where in, in other regions were a lot slower. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about government supports uh, in, in general. There, there, there did seem to be in the whole APAC region, uh, relatively high levels of, of government support. But I, I imagine that given the vastness of the region, it's not equal throughout the entire kind of um, continent. Is that the case? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the pace of support or receiving the support has got a lot to do with the size of the uh, impact of the support, whether it's a big country or a smaller country, that's, uh, that makes a big difference. The other is the political influence of governments over its people uh, it, uh, uh, to, understand, to be able to draw data because it's not just our industry, as you will imagine, they have to support across all industries that matter to uh, their economy. So they they are relying on those data to, um, I guess, to make decision and you know to help the lowest hanging fruit people who really really need uh, them. Um, the other thing that I would say is the fact that in particularly in Asia regions where uh, convention bureaus are more of a government, fully fully government funded uh, uh, base um, as compared to membership base. So because of that, uh, they will have direct connections with the right areas of the government to champion the importance of incentive travel or even business events for that matter. Um, the what, what caused the delay of the pace is really the overall government understanding and the to be able to decipher the difference between tourism, uh, between tourism and business events, so I think the government in Asia has done in Asia Pacific has done a brilliant job to the best of their ability. Uh, but it is it is boiled down to 
how you categorize your company, not just about government saying, all right, business events industry. So if your, if your company is registered as a management consultancy, uh, even though you do business events or incentive travel program design, you will be filed according to the management consultancy industry. So it's a highly com complex matter, but we all know that as soon as there's a vaccine that, that is ready and we totally understand the cost of travel, uh, at the moment, what you see is exactly right in terms of people want a direct flight connection because they don't want a, you know, let's stop, stop somewhere that we are not too sure about their policies. Uh, the, other, that, the other thing that is really clear at the moment uh, from, the, uh, from the bureaus, uh, from what I understand, is that the, the corporate end users are wanting a direct uh, connection and communication line to bureaus to better understand, just in case there's a last minute shutdown, uh, like um, what we did, what we experienced in Malaysia a couple of weeks ago, or a, a, a massive outbreak, suddenly they have to do something about it. So it's not just the proof of uh, how they manage, but it's about the accessibility of information when there is a last minute lockdown, what should one do? So that is one key thing. The other key thing that, uh, that is highly uh, important for anyone who wants to attract business is the contract negotiations between suppliers and buyers. If the if if um, if the perceived risk risk is there in terms of losing money or the uh, you just go into a long legal battle because of the disagreement with cancellation or postponement, uh, any buyers will be quite reluctant to uh, to 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 engage a destination that way. Sure, sure. And uh, let's talk a little bit about destination selection, because I think there's, um, unless you happen to be Australian, New Zealand, uh, or Fiji, or one of those other wonderful kind of Polynesian islands, there's not a lot of very immediate good news for Asian destinations. Um, you know, destinations that have been doing pretty well over the last number of years and really rising up the rankings and, you know, winning really great business. Um, what advice do you have for those DMOs that have been investing, say, in source markets in Europe and in the United States, when the evidence maybe or the research is, is saying that there isn't going to be too much travel to Asia from Europe or the United States in the immediate term? Right. I, I would say that perhaps look at the cost center. Um, obviously, the bigger... Uh, incentive travel groups are always uh, perhaps a multinational company or a, a really large national company to understand where the cost center is. So I think during COVID, there will be a lot of realignment of cost centers. Perhaps uh, the, um, um, there will be a, a, a Asia Pacific office realignment back to a European uh, headquarter or, or anything like that, where the cost is all truly aligned, realigned is to understand where that where where the cost center will be post COVID or as part of COVID recovery, and not to assume that if we see two hundred and fifty uh, Asians going into California, that means the cost center must be in Singapore. So it it doesn't quite work that way. So I think just to be quite mindful. The other thing is I I, I feel that the when Asia start to travel again, uh, you will be quite uh, rapid. Only because very similar to the European region, the the Asia Pacific, the Asia region is so used to regional travel. You know, going to from Singapore to Thailand for us is like hopping into a bus onto a bus uh, because it's only a two hour flight away. So we do that on a long weekend. So. There's only so much appetite for going to similar destinations to, uh, to a certain extent to be able to give people that, wow, it's a wonderful uh, destination that I have not explored. So I'm not surprised at the choice of Canada, for example, uh, because usually uh, we will think, oh, well, uh, we'll get there one day anyway. So right now it falls into a bucket list. I say, I better get there when I have a chance. So now I will choose for Canada, for example. Very good, very good. And in terms of, say, the, um, you know, the European DMOs and DMCs and the US DMOs and DMCs that we're beginning to see uh, evidence of, you know, those mega incentives coming from, from, from China, it will be some time before they will see that business. Isn't that the case? 
Yeah, I, I, and I think that it all depends on um, obviously political landscape or when the uh, Chinese government will promote outbound travel um, again. But I think as soon as that is uh, um, that gateway is open, you will see that you know the you know perhaps what we meant to have a group in February uh, in Paris that will resume at a later stage because sure. it's, it's still a, a bucket list sort of uh, destination. Uh, but also we need to make a we need people to understand that it's not about flying out of your base country that people have got no fear about that. I think people are more fearful about the returning. You know, what if I'm at somewhere and, you know, I got tested positive at the airport, who is going to pay for that? And what is the cost associated with that time loss and, and stress and everything like that? So at the moment, I could see the agencies are, other than learning about hybrid and the cost of hybrid events or experiences, they are looking at, okay, how do they manage that cost? Who's going to pay for it uh, at, a, at, a, at a point whereby spent is actually going downhill? Uh, but, you know, someone has to pay someone. Very good. Very good. Finally, um, El, just in, t- in terms of kind of program design, there's a definite switch into um, this, you know, travel with no strings attached is what, we, is, is what we called it, where I'm focusing really in my program design on the, um, the just the boundless joy of, of, of travel. Um, for, for Asian companies that really do want to, I suppose, achieve those corporate objectives, is, is that going to be a problem? Well, not really, because at the end of the day, uh, for the Asian culture, per se, or whoever that is working in Asia that may not have an Asian background, would know that relationship is everything in Asia. You know, it's really about who you know. So because of that, the, the networking is a different sense of team building, really, because obviously you can't have 50 people doing an activity if it's not safe, but they, they don't mind doing it in five person's lot. But the, the, I can totally understand and agree with the luxury experiences because, um, you know, if, if, you are, if you are stuck in a country and you can only do staycation or you, are only, you can only be at home, for you to justify that travel you want something that is like money can buy right like the way uh the for the site global conference in in rome 2018 we we have access to the vatican when it was shut so people still want that because they know that they will not be able to do it unless it's in a incentive trip ex- travel experience and that is the power of the buying power of incentive travel experiences so so i feel that um it will always shift, but old habits really die hard. Uh, it's, it's just like what happened during 9-11. We have to adjust our mindset when it comes to traveling. If COVID will do the same thing, we will, but we will still travel and we will still have that will. Very good. Al, thank you so much for that uh, really insightful conversation and discussion around the, uh, giving the, the Asia perspective and uh, the filter for understanding what's emerging in this um, very, very interesting uh, survey. The results will be finally available in early December. So this is a kind of a sneak preview in many respects. And uh, this comes from, the, um, from the, 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 the site relationship that we're able to kind of jump ahead, but they will be available in early December on a special micro site that will be accessible through the IRF, FICP or Site Foundation. So please look out for that. For everybody in Asia who filled out the survey, thank you so much. Keep an eye on it in the, in the future years. Uh, it really is so important to give the data because that allows us to tell the story. And by telling the story, we build the power of incentive travel. So again, El, thank you so much for helping us to, uh, to tell that story today. And uh, to all TTG readers, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>